so good evening everyone present here so this is our 10th lecture as uh, you all know so it's been a fun journey from the beginning to the end and uh, we've kind of changed things up a little bit today because um using this new uh, parsec technology we can now collaborate with one or one or even more speakers so okay so the paper we'll be talking mostly about the paper in front of us right now so as you can see here a pictorial introduction to differential geometry leading to maxwell's equations as three pictures so what we are trying to focus on this paper is not the mathematical aspect of differential geometry when when you hear me say that you all be like wait but then differential geometry is just math right it's like differential operators and like integrals and exterior differential forms and blah 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 but then this paper that is why we found this paper so interesting because this paper had literally zero mathematics in it and i'm not exaggerating here you will find zero equations and literally zero derivations so when i first read this paper and then me and pool read this paper we were like you know what we should do a talk on this because this provides a pretty consistent and pretty uh, good base for what people can take forward if they want to study differential geometry so we are three speakers here today me uh, sundram and pugal so i'll be handing the session over to sundram in a while but then before we get started with this i want to make like let's say a small disclaimer right this talk or this lecture isn't a comprehensive lecture or else it doesn't cover everything in differential geometry because you'll be a fool to think so what this paper tries to do at least it doesn't completely um, what do you call it doesn't completely succeed or so but then it tries he he he's, the writer has tried quite a bit to visualize differential geometry so putting forth that disclaimer i would also like to make the point that if you in any way feel lost or you know you feel confused in what this is or what the diagrams are you know don't feel hesitant to ask us any questions or please stick till the end because sometimes you know you might get stuck in in the first section but then i or pugal might clear it up later on and uh, i hand the session over to sundaram sundaram you have the mic uh thank you rishi so yeah um Uh, good evening to everyone here. Uh, my name is Nirm, and I'll just start off right away, right here. Okay, so we can see that differential geometry is um, like you. It's actually supposed to be a very useful tool in physics and mathematics, and it's quite a technical side uh, of you know things because it handles three areas. I would say um, it, it's a combination of three areas rather: um, analysis, uh, geometry, and of course, you know. um wait al algebra yeah so when all these three th- come together um analysis is just a fancy word for calculus if you're wondering so yeah <laughs> um so once you have that um like all the all these three come together and you know you can represent a lot of things but right now we're not going to be going that deep into that like just like rishi said earlier i would also like to you know uh put in the terms the disclaimer he gave that you know you can't expect to understand all of it in just you know one day it's not like just go through it and you'll get everything right there so yeah um uh, like uh well yeah okay uh, can't hear me wait am i audible now 
Yeah, now you're audible. You kind of stopped working like two minutes ago. Go ahead. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, yeah, uh, as you were saying earlier, uh, you know, different, uh, I'd like to further, you know, acclaim the disclaimer that Rishi gave that, you know, we can't understand differential geometry right, uh, right as we are going into it. So, it, this is ra- this paper is rather about understand looking at things understanding them and absorbing you know that for future purposes or like you know like when we actually deal with uh, differential geometry so yeah um, as we can see differential geometry is applicable in both physics and mathematics and in, in the context of physics th- they are applicable for these um, the, these few um, points like three dimensional space of newtonian physics four dimensional space of sp- uh, four-dimensional space-time of special and general relativity, two-dimensional shapes like spheres and tori, um, six-dimensional phase phase in Newtonian mechanics, seven-dimensional phase-time in general relativity, the state space in thermodynamics, um, so on and so forth. Um, yeah, uh, all these are uh, ap- applicable things, but you know, uh, uh, like it's often used for general relativity. Um, if I'm being quite uh, uh, honest and if I remember right, Chilmeya was dealing with this earlier, like, you know, on his on his earlier Sunday session. Yeah. Um, so you could go with multiple dimensions into this, like, you know, it's just geometry and, you know, it's just applicable on all those things. So right here, we will refer to exterior differential forms as, you know, forms. And they're found in both of those. Electromagnetism, uh, you could use it to define uh, electromagnetic fields, or you could even use them as, you know, objects that can be integrated in mathematics. But, you know, we'll stick more to the physics side of this. And, yeah, right here, we have the metric is quite important to define um, differential geometry because, you know, uh, like uh, many, like, like I mentioned right here, you wouldn't un- understand it entirely as long as you get into it. Otherwise, you just, you might as well call it differential topology. So you could think of a manifold, which I'll get to a little later. Um, as a, as a, as it's made of rubber, it's infinitely deformable. But if you have a metric, which is basically something that you know measures the angle between two vectors and vector length, you would have that. Uh, you you could not understand that. But however, it's also uh, like why why aren't we learning with a metric right here? Like why aren't we getting too much into the mathematical part? Like like it's mentioned here, uh, there's a lot of reasons here. And I also told you earlier, we would have to learn things like, you know, uh, capture uh, the whole goal is to, you know, uh, read stuff, uh, uh, look, look at the images, uh, whatever, and uh, capture them and, you know, understand them, ha- have a sense of intuition when we do this. Um, another reason is that, you know, um, you could co- you could construct a manifold on any, any form and it could... Uh, you know, like you could construct on any metric and doesn't have a single preferred metric or like not one with a physical significance. Like you could put a manifold in any form. So yeah, um, like for, uh, an example is right here. Phase space does not possess a metric and neither do natural manifolds which study differential equations. Um, so yeah, in order to, uh, you would also need like uh, stress, the stress energy momentum tensor for, you know, or, or in order to derive Einstein's equations, you have all those examples. So before we get, dive into it, we try to understand the things before we actually go into it. So yeah, that's one thing that I'm going to make clear right here. And yeah, uh, when we can also depict Maxwell equations with this and, you know, uh, pictorially represent electromagnetism and electrodynamics, but the problem with Maxwell equations right here is mentioned. Um, they are represented on four-dimensional space-time, and we don't have four-dimensional paper, of course. I mean, quite honestly, paper is viewed in a very layman way as two-dimensional, but it actually has three dimensions, but you actually can't represent three dimensions there. But yeah, you get the picture. So even if we were blessed with four-dimensional paper, there would be five spatial dimensions, and therefore six-dimensional space-time. So you could keep going on and, you know, there's always going to be a challenge with Maxwell equations. But like, like I said, we'll be, we'll not go too much into the physics right now. Rather, we'll just be viewing the images and try to get the intuition we would need when we are handling the physics part of this. All right. 
so getting into what manifolds are uh, manifolds are like you know very uh, fundamental objects in differential geometry there are a number of complex ways to explain this but you know if you could just look at a manifold and in a very intuitive way we could say if we zoom into a manifold like we do right here a patch of a sphere if we keep zooming in we notice that the patch keeps getting uh, you know flatter like you know the poles or anything as such like you could visualize the earth or anything you would often notice that uh, in in the in the in the map of the earth they would show the north pole and south pole as flat so you know you can view the earth as a manifold because you know you can always represent it in a flat manner there is a more complicated def- there are more complicated definitions in, with respect to euclidean spaces and other stuff but you know we will stay out of that and rather focus more on the images so yeah um you have examples of manifolds right here the a point has zero dimensions a curve has one dimension uh, a surface has two dimensions you get the picture three dimensions for a volume and blah 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 um like okay so if i ha- if i had to um, rep- represent this like you know you could keep going you could keep uh, di- dissecting these images and you'd often get a flat point like in a curve you keep zooming in you would get a flat point at some point right so yeah you have a manifold right there and even here while this doesn't look to uh, just keep zooming in and you'll keep if i find what you're looking for like it's going to be a flat surface um, but versus this a, co- a corner so if we keep zooming inside this we often notice that we're just reaching another corner and you know keep noticing that it's actually a corner and not something you could you know flatten out so that's not a manifold so yeah uh, getting right into what a submanifold is um a submanifold is a manifold continuous with a larger manifold this is like sub a manifold within a manifold so yeah an embedding manifold that's another way to call it right here so yeah um the submanifold can either be the same dimension as the uh, the manifold it is in or it could be a different dimension altogether a, a, a different dimension altogether in the sense there's a limitation it can't go higher than the you know uh, same dimension or or the lower, lower dimension like it can't go on a higher dimension than because that's uh, just thinking to realism that's not possible so yeah uh, yeah right here i can show you some examples uh here's a sub manifold right here within a one dimensional uh, manifold and yeah this is another two dimensional manifold uh yeah right here e- e- so on and so forth there's a tori within a three dimensional manifold and a sphere within a three dimensional manifold and yeah getting to what compact and non compact poles are um in the in embedded manifolds there there's often you know uh b- boundaries when they're limited by boundaries uh there are you know they're compact like this one for instance this one is compact because it's you know so surrounded by boundaries right here but a non compact manifold like this one you see right here stretches up to infinity or like wh- whatever is the limit right here of the uh, you know manifold it is within just think of this as shapes i know manifold and sub manifold seem like very fancy terms but you know they just simple shapes uh, just make sure that you can define a manifold as something that if you zoom into it you get a flat surface as such all right so next we'll be looking at you know um, scalar fields uh, what are scalar fields right there um, so get once you have a manifold the simplest thing you can define are scalar fields and yeah you could define them simply as real numbers associated with each point so like if uh, wait let me find it right yeah if i have a point right here like this one for instance um there is there's a point right here there's another point right here so yeah each are represented by real numbers so yeah intermediate values and some of the values yeah so that's one way of looking at that and yeah wait let me go to this um guys am i audible yeah you are yeah okay okay cool cool i'll just go on all right so uh, vector fields on the other hand are like v- vectors or a, a finite number of vectors there's a vector at each point and you know the smoothness of a vector field corresponds to the nearby vectors not differing too much i can you know sh- show show this further like right here 
this this is a scalar field and it's a function of x and y right here like, you know there's an x graph and a y graph consider this a simple representation of a scalar field on a euclidean space uh yeah uh, after that you know you have the representative vector field right here you have arrows to point out and yeah uh also you have uh, the scalar field depicted in contours where the arrows are pointing right up so right here you can notice that the closer the contours are the more the curve is going to be you can represent this in multiple forms and you know you can get uh, uh, like a scalar that's basically real numbers at every point and vectors that are you know arrows pointing uh, all right so let me get to orientation which is you know a little bit of a tr tricky one because this paper presents this in a presents this in a very abstract manner but you know i will try to explain this as well as i can okay. so consider a, a single you know two dimensional image in a euclidean space like a uh, nuclear space r3 you have a, a, a two dimensional object if you can you know uh, flip it about its surface and still not get its mirror image then it is orientable but if you flip it about and it get its mirror image it is not orientable and an example of a non orientable manifold would be uh, would be a mobius strip or a klein bottle so if i was to explain this in a uh, in one way mobius strips have a boundary and but however like you know an ant could travel you know the classic you know rule of a mobius strip an ant could travel on a mobius strip while traversing both the sides and returning to its same point without having crossed a single boundary and a klein bottle doesn't have any boundaries it just fills in within itself around its you know the walls of the entry point uh, around the walls of the if you not sure what a klein bottle is you could always google it and take a look so right there if you flip those two like ima now imagine rather than imagining flipping a client bottle i'm presuming that not a lot of people know it um imagine flipping a mobius strip you would obviously get the mirror image of it and therefore it's not orientable there are more examples of non orientable images such as non orientable manifolds such as you know um uh, roman spheres and all that but you know uh, feel free to explore when we are done okay so right here there are right here in this diagram you have multiple ways of representing you know orientations which i'll get to in a while um the use of orientation are it's important for integration in stokes theorem and orientation only affects the overall sign like but when you're adding forms you need orientation to you know get stuff together we'll see how we add forms or rather concatenate them the pictures are pretty of course <laughs> okay so yeah mm, orientation on manifolds on an internal scale we'll just look at internal for manifolds there's also internal external orientation but that's only for sub manifolds how we are going to look at what now we'll just look at manifolds before we get to sub manifolds all right so right here you, i showed you the images and it's uh, like for a zero dimensional manifold you have pluses or minuses albeit uh, the conventionally you have to represent it as a plus for a one dimensional manifold which is a curve or a line you have arrows that point up or down for a two dimensional manifold which has you know two uh, two dimensional length and breadth let's say um, you have an arc which points in a clockwise or an anti clockwise direction but versus for a three dimensional manifold you would have a helix structure representing it like you know a right handed manifold would go on the right way and a left handed manifold would go on the left way like you can see in this diagram clockwise and anti clockwise um, you can see in this diagram that you know it keeps uh, you don't need really need an arrow to represent this and just you could just look at it and infer that you know this is a way to represent a three dimensional like orient a three dimensional manifold okay so yeah right here like just like i said uh, you have a plus or minus you have conventionally have a, pl a plus you have an arrow pointing one way or the other you have you know my arc pointing clockwise or anti clockwise on a three dimensional manifold you'd have a helix pointing one away or or another and you know just like i said earlier you can observe that unlike in uh, one dimensional two dimensional cases you don't need an arrow for helix so yeah uh, next we have orientation on sub manifolds now this is where it gets slightly interesting because like i said earlier within a manifold you have a sub manifold and since uh, ma manifold like sub manifolds are just embedded manifolds uh, 
they can be orientable or non orientable with orientable manifolds you notice that there's internal and external manifolds like for an internal manifold it's pretty much the same like a, a, a like you know a orientation for a manifold but with external you would have something that's quite interesting like for internal manifold you can just remember this apply to the manifold within that but if the manifold is external let's say protruding out we'll see some examples of it as we progress i know it's a little abstract but uh, i would uh, rather i would uh, you know prefer if you guys like actually viewed this you know ca- sort of visualize it which is why we have a lot of pictures right here because if this is just text we'd be completely lost anyway um external orientations depend not just on the dimension of sub manifold but also the dimension of the embedding manifold so you know the manifold uh, sub manifold the if the sub manifold is external it also depends on the dimension of the manifold that you know b- bounds it so yeah right here you have the table so wait for a point 0 0 for a point within a point you just have plus or minus but you know for a point within a line which is the embedding dimension right here is the manifold sub manifold dimension is this ma- sub manifold the external sub manifold right here you'd have the points that go up or go down uh, for a one dimensional manifold and a one dimensional uh, you know sub manifold uh, you would have plus or minus like so on and so forth you can just combine both and take a look at it i i mean you can take a look at this and you know have some have a have a look for at it for like 30 seconds maybe i'll just explain it to you meanwhile so you have a sub manifold like a point right there so this sub manifold dimension is zero so it's within the you know surface and therefore it will have like the arc like structure and for a three dimensional manifold the point is within a three dimensional uh, ma- uh, uh, three sorry for this uh, zero dim for a point or rather a zero dimensional sub manifold there's a three dimensional uh, cube cube or spheroid or whatever you prefer as a three dimensional manifold uh that would have a helix like structure with the dots which would have which would be following the orientation and for one like i uh, i already explained that earlier so yeah um you have the embedding dimension right here is uh, two dimensional you know one dimensional line so it's a line within a uh, surface and then a line within a uh, you know three dimensional figure and you know uh an uh, another arc within a two dimensional you know two dimensional sphere manifold like right here three dimensional spheres and uh, you know three dimension embedding dimensions and sub manifold dimensions you can you know visualize so on and so forth i would you know not uh, want to hinder that so it's up to you to visualize but right here i could i would like to explain this you know, because this has a this seems quite obvious so a three dimensional manifold a three dimensional em- uh, embedding manifold and a sub manifold dimension you know is a two dimensional line so it's a surface that points out right here you could probably visualize the thumb rule that would be a classic example for this and yeah this could you know be electrons or anything as such uh, uh you know sub atomic particles within atoms and such um into uh, so internal and external twisted and untwisted where do these you know um, merge together you would call an internal orientation as untwisted and external orientation as twisted so right here you have a table which dictates what uh, whether these are definable and essential as such and also does uh, also if you have not figured out yet vectors and forms also have orientations so they may be twisted or untwisted or they may also be internal and external like you can see this table right here um external it would be twisted objects which can have orientations and the correspondence between untwisted versus uh, twisted and internal versus external yeah so yeah next we we'll view at concatenation of orientations okay so what is concatenation that's basically adding two things together um you can combine two orientations together like take uh, take this one where we rather than me explaining the text uh, and you know make uh, i rather have you visualize this so yeah uh, right here you have a, a point which is dictated by a plus the plus plus a line gives rise to you know is this 0 plus 1 so it should just result in 1 and this again 0 1 plus 0 which is still you know 0 again uh, 
uh, but this is again one plus one, which results in two. So this gives you two dimensions. It's just you know basic addition math and whatever we learned right now. But you know you can visualize that and you'd get an idea of that. Versus this, this is this revol- this is around a surface. So this is two plus one, which would give rise to three, so on and so forth. So this is this is how you concatenate orientations, like you know combine two orientations together and you know get that. But also you can see that untwisted orientations. Me, you're I'm, audible. I'm, audible now. I'm audible now. Yeah, you're audible now. Yeah. Okay, okay, my Go internet's ahead. glitching a little, so yeah. Sorry about that. We all have bad internet. Go ahead. Okay. Um, is this fine now? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Cool. 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 Right. Um, network seems to be too slow. Please stand by. Okay, wait. Um, give me two minutes. I'll just get back to. So yeah, where where did you guys? get cut off before you know, i was doing it hello yeah you yeah, the concatenation of yeah concatenation yeah. okay thankfully I go ahead uh, not too much is lost okay so right here we have you know okay my see my network seems to be a little slow so yeah wait give me two minutes i will be back Okay, I hope that's better. Right. Okay, now I can present it to you. Hmm. Okay, now I was at concatenation right there, and like I said, you can just visualize this. Like I said, uh, like we said earlier, this paper is quite easy to understand. But before we dive into differential geometry, I would uh, like to let you all know that whatever we, we are visualizing right now is not what it exactly is, because it goes a lot more deeper than that. um right here in this diagram we can see a uh, curves created by you know pipe cleaners like the authors ask us to refer to some pipe cleaners so you know a line that goes from x to z to y would create a helix um so it's just a combination of dimensions right there and you're you know concatenate and get stuff that's about it so yeah um Uh, there is just what I explained earlier in much more uh, in mu- in a little more you know scientific terms, but yeah, I'll get to inheritance of orientation by the boundary of a submanifold. So if a submanifold has a internal orientation and a boundary, um, let's just say I am I'm not quite sure about what I can give us. Let's just say a circle, for instance, within a sphere or, or a sphere within a sphere, and uh, you know a sphere doesn't exactly have a boundary. so it's not exactly a good example but yeah you can imagine any uh, or let's just say uh, like a circle right there if it has a boundary then the boundary also inherits the internal orientation so right here we can see those examples of that and if it's an external manifold it's going to have you know uh, it uh, ex- inherits the external orientation because right here you can see you know uh, orientation of a, a one dimensional manifold it has you know pluses and minuses and goes uh, uh uh you know it follows the same convention it just obtains that from the you know uh, manifold it's within so yeah uh, the boundary of a two dimensional manifold again like you can notice the boundary also in his the arc like you know anti clockwise arc is going in and the boundary of a three dimensional manifold of course you have a sphere right here and you know it is uh, following the same same helix rotation of the three dimensional ball uh for an external one right here you can notice how this follows more of a helix structure just uh, revolves around and you know catches on so yeah that's one uh th- th- this again an external one where you have it pointing out uh, and the boundary is also you know go- going in an anti clockwise direction this is going in the uh, you know anti clockwise direction again like towards the right um so this also follows the same way follows in the same way and the boundary of a three dimensional manifold right there you have it pointing inside like you know the charge is uh, the plus is within is the external orientation of the three dimensional ball right here 
uh the external orientation is three dimensional ball and the arrow is pointing inwards in the external orientation of the two dimensional sphere which is within so yeah um orientation of vectors so we know, like i said earlier vectors and forms can also have their own you know orientations so yeah they can have internal untwisted orientations such untwisted orientations um and you know there's another type of vector called twisted vectors right here um and they are also called axial or pseudo vectors an example of this is a vector such as magnetic field beam so right here you have uh, uh twist uh, twisting and untwisting vectors so yeah like but but rather this is more of a reference to twisting and untwisting so yeah i'll just take away from that um we can they look like external orientation of one dimensional manifolds as depicted in table 1 which is you know right here which was follows the same convention but just apply that to a vector rather than you know us by applying that to a manifold so twisting and untwisting this will be what i cover last if a manifold has an orientation we can use it to change the type of orientation of a sub manifold so if like a manifold has like let's just say uh, the embedding orientation is this we can use it to change the sub manifold's external orientation so that twists it um like for instance we can also convert an internal orientation into an external orientation so yeah uh, there's convertibility right here twisting and untwisting that's that's exactly what this is about um the convention we use here is to say that if we concatenate the external orientation first followed by the internal orientation one must have the orientation of the manifold like right here so you could notice that if you take the internal one it would be like this and the external one it would be like that so looking at these examples and visualizing would help you understand what this is uh, starting with the untwisted form and then twisting and then untwisting it does not change the orientation so you know twisting and then untwisting just gets it back to the normal state but you know if you twist it if it's twisted and untwisted it will probably have a different one right there so you can notice right here how it happens so um, that's about you know for my part um, if you guys have any doubts you could ask away guys okay so i think it would be appropriate if we hold the yeah yeah, yeah, yeah session that's at right. the end that's right yeah. that's right that's right yeah so i think we have a time constraint as well right? yeah yeah True. so so yeah go ahead uh, i'll okay. give you a flow to rishi okay so oh i see you did a lot of highlighting okay so just i'm just going to start off by um, summing up what sundaram said so what is a manifold is the first question so this is a basic paper so i'd like to stick to the basic definition a manifold is just an object right so let's take this sphere or a ball and that's called a manifold and what's a sub manifold as the name suggests it's a manifold within a manifold right so then twisting and untwisting let's just take it as you know to give the manifold an orientation right so then to say okay fine it's going in this direction or you're supposed to look at the ball in this direction because you could look at it from any way right so then to give it some sort of let's say a perception or a rotation or something like that we use twisting and untwisting but then do do make a note that even untwisted manifolds are essentially twisted or have an orientation but they are of an external type and internal uh, internal twisted manifolds are ones with what we call as twisted manifolds so i'll be moving on to the differential part of the differential geometry so so far all we've heard was just geometry right just balls and you know uh, shapes within the ball and stuff like that so then we'll see where the part differential comes from that so what are closed forms right whoops the internet's being a bit wonky here you know let's just forget this page for a moment right so then what are forms so by definition forms are actually multilinear functions or maps right which takes a vector and outputs a number or a real number right and as we saw in this paper right so we don't want any math in it so i'd like to make an apology that you know let's 
remove that definition of that uh, calling a form a multilinear function, right? But instead, what we can look at forms are as objects or tools that we use in differential geometry to perform calculus and other operations on these shapes or what we call manifolds, right? Since if you notice till now, we haven't talked anything about a coordinate system, right? Either polar, polar coordinate or like a Euclidean coordinate. We've never mentioned any of that because we can see that manifolds are independent of coordinates, right? It's what coordinate system that we choose that the, that the manifold obtains, okay? So when an object doesn't have a coordinate system, right? How would you perform calculus? How would you find the uh, derivative at one point of the manifold or the integ in integral around that manifold, right? So there is a small question there. And that is where the form, the word forms come in, right? So right now I'd like to take, make you think that forms are integrals, okay? So then let me just scroll down, just skip all of that, it's useless. Okay, so let's take forms as integrals, okay? So what's the zero form or like, uh, we call them as zero forms or top forms, right? So zero forms are essentially just scalar values, right? They are constants in a field, such as we saw before a scalar field, right? And then we move on one dimensional more. So what is a one form? So many of you already probably know the answer. A one form is an integral, right? A one form is a line integral. So it's an integ integration in one dimension. So essentially, Let's, yeah, like if you see, there's a red line there. So we take in, we take an integral on that red line. So a one form is essentially a line integral, right? So we can extrapolate that knowledge onto two forms as being surface integrals and three forms being volume integrals, right? So I'd like to make another small point here. Again, I'm defeating the purpose of the paper, but for those who are interested, right? A more rigorous definition that we can take for forms are that we can define them as covectors, right? So you can look this up and maybe, you know, take this as a starting point for doing actual differential geometry. But again, talking more on, you know, covectors and tensors will provide a gateway to flood this lecture with mathematics, which I don't want to do. You don't want to hear me do that. So now let me straight away start with the operations that we perform on manifolds, right? On, uh, sorry, on forms, right? So let's take this diagram here. Am I, is my cursor smooth or am I like moving all around the place? So, okay. So I assume that my cursor is quite cohesive. Hello? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you can hear me, right? Thank you. So uh, I was pretty stuck there, right? So, okay, so let's take this example, right? So this is a one form, right? So how I would like, to, like you to visualize this is, you see these lines here, right? Let me just use this to just look cool. So then you can take this as a field, right? So this is essentially just like this, right? It's just going in this direction, right? It's going right. Okay, and then the blue line is the same. It's just going this way, right? So that's pretty simple. So what happens when you add both of these forms? It's simple. So there are fields that are going this way and there are fields that are going that way. So then you just add them and then there you got a field that's going this way, right? So these are untwisted one forms as if they have external rotation, external orientation, right? But then you see here we have twisted one forms which have which have internal orientation, right? As we see, it's pretty visual here. We have an internal, internally oriented one form, right? So this takes up a different addition law, right? So then <clears throat> this line goes this way, this line goes this way, and then you get a, and then you get a one form going this way, right? So then only the orientation changes, right? So then let's just talk about multiplication of vectors and forms by scalar fields. So 
if you study 10th grade physics you would obviously know what happens when you multiply a uh, scalar with a vector field it's simple the vector gets multiplied by the scalar quantity right and the same thing what it's analogous so a scalar you multiplied by a vector a vector field you multiplied by a scalar field right so then we have already talked about addition of forms and then i'd like to take to you talk to you about the wedge product right so what is the wedge product right so then we talked about forms as integrals right so then uh, if we take this diagram here right this diagram here yes so then essentially what all these confusing diagrams are saying are so you take two one forms right so then they are one dimensional line integrals and then you perform an operation called the wedge product right so what the wedge product does it essentially forms let's say again i'm heavily visualizing here don't take my word for it it's not mathematically correct right so then you can perceive the wedge product between two uh, line integrals as it forms a rectangle right and then you get the surface integral right so then you get a two form and then so what happens when you multiply a two form and a two form together it's simple you get a three form right so then now we've got we finished up with all of that now yes we're going to look at integration right now this is where the differential and the calculus part of the entire talk comes in right so then let's see this right the sphere right what we're essentially doing here is we're just passing a field right a twisted one form field inside a sphere right so then essentially what these lines are are integrals so when we pass let's say 1 2 3 4 lines in here so there are three lines that are going up and so there three, one there's one line going down so let's take the integral of this to be 3 right i'm just making a basic assumption here right but then what we do see is we only get the value 3 if we assume that the form is non closed or they have a boundary but then what we are talking about here is a specific form called closed forms yes and what are closed forms so a closed form is essentially an integral which has no boundary or something that closes in on itself so this is a one form right and this is a closed one form yes and then you see these ones they don't seem to close in on them. so how can we look at this right so we can just imagine this to be a huge and infinitely large circle right that ultimately closes in on itself so i think that is pretty clear so i'll move on to books it's raining heavily here so that it, conservation okay yes. <clears throat> if if i have some uh, breaks in between or like some uh, crackling voice please do feel free to tell me to stop right so 4.5 conservation laws right so simple what are conservation laws some conservation laws that we know or you know conservation law of thermodynamics right conservation laws of energy and conservation of current and all of that right so then how does differential calculus come in there so conservation laws state that hello okay so my voice is breaking no 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 it's clear on it was okay, yeah. but that's fine now ah okay no problem uh, i'll that's what okay hello yeah so what are conservation laws right so oh can you just give me a minute my car seems to be getting flooded i'll just come in a few seconds just Okay, so I'm sorry that those are just some problems you need to face when you're in the wilderness, right? So, okay, can we continue, Google? 
Hello. I'm audible, right? Yeah, but your your voice is a little break breaking a little. Ah, okay. Don't worry. Your voice is no, a little my voice robotic, was... but that's fine. No, no, my voice was actually cracking. I'm sorry, like it's cold outside. So okay, so we are looking at conservation laws, right? So then, what are conservation laws? Conservation laws just simply state that the integral of a closed form is zero, right? So there are three conditions which essentially uh, puts this into place. So the submanifold of dimension p must be the boundary of another submanifold of dimension p plus one. So what essentially says is that. So let's take you have a circle inside a circle, right? So then. the submanifold inside right so then the smaller circle in the smaller sphere inside is essentially a smaller part of that bigger circle and essentially has a boundary inside that sphere sorry sphere right so then that's essentially that simple so the p plus 1 dimension manifold must not go to infinity so then the submanifold shouldn't just you know extend to infinity because as we saw closed forms need to close in on themselves right so then when there are just line integrals which extend to infinity but ultimately close in on themselves when we have a manifold that is that extends to infinity we see that that doesn't apply here right it right or to say that the closed form is well the integral uh, of a closed form is zero one second uh, no? rishi like, you got you cut off trailed off yeah. you trailed yeah, off like we weren't able to hear what you're saying okay, so where did i tell off um when you explain about conservation like right when you got to the next page i'll say okay so i was just talking about this right so i was not i didn't say anything much hmm, so yeah. i was just saying that you see you need to make sure that the integral of a closed form is zero right that's the only thing you need to know right mm -hmm. so then let's right. take this yeah let's take this annulus here right it has a hole right so ah, another thing i mentioned was that a manifold there are there are no laws that states that manifolds themselves shouldn't have any holes right but then our conservation law states that whenever we integrate if we integrate over a hole the integral is non zero right and when an integral is non zero the form is not closed right so we have an annulus here right so let us visualize this right what do they mean by all these lines and gibberish right so this line here this is a form right this is a one form right this is a closed one form because we see that it goes around and closes in on itself right so when we take the path of integration to be this right so we integrate over this place right so when we integrate over this blue line we can obviously see that we don't pass any holes right there are no holes in this part of the manifold so we can in, we can ensure that the integral is zero right because it closes in on itself but then when we take this green part, part of integration we can see that we pass through a hole or we have a hole inside right so it's intuitive why we can see that there is the integral is non zero right so if we did basic calculus you'll probably understand what that means so yes so yes i'll just mention about what the dram cohomology is so the dram cohomology is you know if you, if you want to just visualize it it's pretty hard or you don't want to visualize that or what this is entirely useful in is in the actual mathematical part right of differential geometry but then we don't want to look at the math so i'll probably skip on it but then i'll just give you a gist on what that is so we saw that uh, the integral for the integral to be zero the manifold should not have any holes right so then when you cannot visualize right so right now we can see i ah, there's a big big hole in the torus right when when we take complex manifolds or like something much more uh, non visual we don't know exactly whether it, 
we are integrating it over a hole or you know we're just integrating it without holes right so then the dram cohomology essentially provides the framework to make sure that wherever we are integrating it right it has no holes right so that essentially so four dimensions is you know i'll just leave that off because that defeats the purpose of the entire paper because we cannot visualize four dimensions right we've heard examples of you know x y z and t when even that time dimension we can't physically just visualize it so i'll skip over that and this is pretty simple um, am i not scrolling now non closed forms right so non closed forms are, an, are are the exact opposite of closed forms right they have an integral value right so let us take this simple example here oops i am scrolling all over the place i'm sorry so these lines are non closed one forms right so then if we do basic addition right remember what is integration we just you know we use the riemann sum and then we just add up the individual part and then we just try to find out the area of any given shape so then let's take this square right or this place so then when we move in this direction right we can see that we only have one form one one form passing of it's pretty confusing so then the in- value of integral here is 1 okay then if we take the opposite path here you know i'm just going to skip the counting because we don't have much time so we can see that 1 2 3 4 5 6 something so we can see that the value of the integral changes on the path taken right so in these while non closed forms are called form sub manifolds right because when any when any line closes in on itself we get a shape right but then these non closed forms do not close in on themselves so we do not have a shape right so this is all just you know it's not needed i ah, a yes, stokes theorem one thing while i was reading this paper the stokes theorem is very very important in uh, differential geometry it essentially states that the curl the integral of a curl of any object is equal to the differential the exterior differential of the one form surrounding that manifold right but then we don't need that again it's because that's going to defeat the purpose so what are differential exterior operators ah, yes so i forgot to mention what this is this is pretty simple so let's take a shape right let's take a ball or the scalar field as we saw saw before right and what the differential exterior differential operator does is it essentially finds the derivative or the gradient of every point around that shape right and then outputs a, outputs a, let's say a scalar field or let's say wait let me go back to that image long back essentially just outputs an image like this right so then it essentially gets a gradient of every point around that manifold and gives returns its value right so scrolling down scrolling down am i audible yeah 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 you uh, are I, i sound yeah. like uh, one of these uh, professors on zoom class you know I'm like are you audible am i audible then it's yeah. all bad it's all That's bad it's right right yeah. so then okay other operation for scalars and vectors i'll finish this up very quickly so combining one form and a vector field to give a scalar field so again so let's take this example right so then we have a one form right that's line 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 and then the one form is let's say going this way right so then this is very simple we just combine the untwisted one form right and an untwisted vector field a vector field that's going this way and what simply what we do is we just count the number of lines that this vector passes through that. so it's 1 2 3 4 and 5 right but then we see here that it's minus 5 right so why is it minus 5 simple because the we can uh, it's oriented to the left right so the next one is vectors acting on a scalar field a vector acting on a scalar field gives a new vector scalar field uh, 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 it's not needed and then one uh, rishi one okay yeah, yeah like how is it oriented to the 
see right it see we said that see if it's untwisted right it doesn't mean that it isn't oriented right so an untwisted one form is essentially an exterior oriented one form right so then we see that the orientation isn't like this right so the orientation is this way right so see again we are trying to visualize this if we want to take this mathematically okay, okay. we take this as a covector and a vector and then we multiply it and then that outputs a scalar right mm mm-hmm. and then again to visualize it i said it in that way but then if you want mathematical rigor you could refer to the okay. textbooks right so okay. internal contractions again this is uh, another simple concept only okay so then let's take this uh, line here right it's uh, untwisted two form right and then this vector blue so essentially visually what what is happening here is so we are just extending this this way right so like we are providing infinite lines and so that produces this green uh what's it one form untwisted one form right so then we see as sundaram was talking about was the cocantation of uh, orientation right so then this is going this way so and the vector is going this so essentially it becomes like this right so so far all the simple stuff is over so i'm going to be handing over the harder bits and the metric and all of that and how all of this connects to maxwellian electrodynamics over to pugal pugal um no nope, you're not audible man not yet you are not audible again if you have any questions we will be hosting a question session at the end so feel free to ask yeah you are audible now all right perfect let me yep uh, go, go ahead please. yep uh, so i mean there's nothing really difficult about what i'm about to say uh, in fact i would argue that we've all seen uh, just everything that i'm about to explain to you uh, in chinmaya's lectures right so we're just going to be looking at what we've already seen but in a more rigorous formalism from all the stuff that we've learned right so as sundram said earlier the metric is perhaps one of the most important objects in differential geometry it's basically an object that allows you to compute the length of something and we've already seen the metric for example in minkowski uh, space minkowski space we had the n mu nu term this is basically the minkowski metric right but in general like chinmay had mentioned earlier we refer to metrics as g mu nu in physics we use mu and nu because we are usually dealing with four dimensions three dimensions of space and one dimension of time and we use greek letters so that's the convention and if you want to take up a naive case of how a metric is a metric is basically just a matrix that allows us to compute the length and the angle between two things and i'll show you a very toy example of how it's sort of defined so G mu nu. If we take it as just two dimensions, you can define it to be the dot product of the basis vectors e mu and e mu e nu, right? So this could be uh, the x. Uh, this could be i hat in Cartesian terms, and this could be j hat in Cartesian terms. So your your Euclidean metric would look. Okay, I'm just trying to find the white space. Would look something like i hat i hat i hat j hat, and this would be j hat i hat and then this would be j hat j hat so in a sense you know that they are mutually perpendicular so you know the dot product would be zero and it would just essentially be one so this is what the metric uh, for euclidean two dimensional spaces a three dimensional space it's just another one in the diagonal uh, and we'll see more examples but the essence is that the metric can be defined this way in a very limited sense uh, and this is probably the first equation i am going to be throwing more at you because i think right now we've got a visual idea of things and we're sort of ready to build ahead uh, of what we've already learned from special relativity and the rest, the parts of this lecture right so the how can a metric let you uh, you know compute angles well it's pretty simple you have the dot product here and the dot product is basically just the magnitude of e mu 
times magnitude of e nu times the cosine of the angle between them right and that's pretty much it you just have to sort of move terms and you can then get the uh, angle between them and there's another interesting thing well it it can tell you the distance between two points but it does so by uh, something known as a geodesic very weird term very interesting term let's uh, let's keep this geodesic in mind for what we're about to see next because if you want to know the distance between two points it's basically the length along the geodesic between them right let's just keep that in our head uh, for our second for a second also there's a very uh, very fancy statement here it enables you to con oops i it enables you to convert into vectors one forms and vectors into one forms it's called the metric dual it's a really 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 fancy way of saying i can basically raise or lower i'm not going to write lower because it's a larger word <laughs> you can basically raise or lower indices right that's what we've been doing all along in special relativity but here's the thing your raised index and your lower index although they appear like okay they are, i just i'm turning a column uh, matrix into a row matrix or a row matrix into a column matrix although it's so simple you have to understand that the uh, row matrix and the column matrix actually are very i'm sorry uh, ஒரே uh column vectors live in vector space and your row vectors live in a dual space well that's a very naive way of looking at it because your dual space has a set of five rules otherwise you can't call something a dual space or a covector space and you can't call something a vector space without a few set of properties right so this is just something that i want to hint upon right now and also you can convert p forms into n minus p forms uh, we'll look at this later as well it's called the hodge dual well if you if you want me to expand upon what a p form is well as rishi mentioned earlier your uh, two form uh, which is also called a bilinear form uh, is just a very fancy way of saying hey i'm taking a vector uh, i'm taking a covector or i'm taking a row matrix and a column matrix and i'm going to give you a real number all right that's a very fancy way of saying that a p form is a very very fancy way of saying there's a function that takes in p number of vectors there are vp number of vectors all right and it's going to give me a real number and what the p form essentially does is it allows us to generalize ideas of volume and area to n dimensions so if you have v vectors uh, over a manifold that has n dimensions all right so you have p n uh, basis vector so you can just uh, take the p form of it and that would give you a real number and that would basically be the n volume so n volume is basically a fancy way of saying okay if i have two dimensions it's area it's area and then if i have three dimensions it's volume so yeah so we're just slowly adding some rigor into what we've just got to and of course we've seen the issue of signature uh, in the in the minkowski matrix uh, or the minkowski metric yeah minus plus 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 as the signatures where minus basically stands for the time dimension but also uh, there's an equivalence here you can also alternatively as chinmaya suggested in the lecture earlier you can also use plus minus minus and the reason you can use two different metrics is uh, we as physicists only give a shit or oops uh, only <laughs> care about uh, these uh, properties so we care about this property which is to say if i multiply the metric by the lorentz transformation i must uh, in the special way i must get the metric back and if i multiply let's say any position vector or as they say a four vector all right if i lorentz transform it and if i again multiply by a covector 
which is basically i'm trying to find the uh, you know space time interval just to say if i apply the lorentz transform to space time interval there's going to be no change so these are the only two things that we care about that's why we have two different metrics and chinmay also did go into uh, it for a bit uh, you can refer to his lecture if you'd like to know more about it or we'll also be exploring it in the upcoming you know set of talks as well well let's get down to business which is <laughs> how do we represent a manifold i'm sorry a metric and how do we represent it in space time all right or, or in minkowski space right so this is how you would represent a metric so how would i calculate the length of a vector i would just look at the number of lines it's passing through so this is a it's a rather very visual representation of a metric again not all metrics have to look like this not all metrics are like this but this is a way way of thinking of things another way of thinking of it would be just to think of you know the lines uh, the lines of a grid in a graph sheet is basically if that's a metric right so again you're going to we fundamentally care about special relativity here and as a consequence general relativity so i'll get right to the point so we had actually seen uh, we had ex explored special relativity in 2 plus 1 dimensions which is to say two dimensions of space one dimension of time so this is a very terribly drawn light cone you can see this is a light cone yeah oh god why did i draw it uh, so yeah well there are three ways of classifying vectors um and it all depends on this light cone so i'll just zoom in so if my light if my vector lies on this it's called a light like vector if it lies in here it's space like if it lies lies outside it it's called time like uh that is to say if i calculate the length here it will be larger than zero if i calculate the length here right along the the this uh, edge and this there is a reason this edge is very important because in uh, minkowski space we have a convention of representing the line that makes a 45 degree to all the time like yes hello yes yeah pogol you kind of broke away in the middle i think Oops. yeah when yeah. when did i break away Oopsies. i don't know like i i was explaining the stuff on the light i was explaining the stuff on the light okay was i here where did i where did i go where did i yeah go? yeah where you away? kind of left where right. you were waving your mouse there yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so very uh, quickly to brief on that uh, if you if your point lies inside the light cone you have a space time interval of larger than 0 if it lies right on the edge it's called light like and it has an interval of 0 and if it lies outside it has an interval less than 0 and you can pretty much just take any four vector multiply it by uh, you know just do the math of shoving in the Uh, metric and you can see that if you really want your uh, space time interval to be less than 0 you end up outside the light cone and uh, so on but again the representation widely differs and that's, that's exactly why you have three different diagrams before we go there this is probably a more naive example to look at if you want to look at unit spheres on flat space you can see that they're sort of all uniform right their their uh, volume is in distorted their area is in distorted and so on but if you look at curved space things are going to look a little more uh, messier a little more stretched out a little more distorted so let's just keep that in mind and the reason uh, we have uh, three different representations of the metric of the same metric in minkowski space uh, is because these three vectors act in completely different ways uh, 
well to start off time like vectors well okay they represent the velocity of uh, massive particles is what the author is saying i can't vouch for it uh, i've not studied it but they yes they point to one of the two components always they so in a sense you can distinguish between future pointing uh, time like vectors and past pointing uh, time like vectors so you would essentially use the metric in as two sheets uh, one is an upper hyperboloid and one is a lower one as shown in this diagram and whoops all right so outside the light cone is space like not time like i am uh, sorry yes and uh, space like means uh, chinmay was just pointing out to me uh, space like basically means they are not causally connected and in fact if you look at the last uh, the last friday talk we talked about bell's version of causality which is to say if your two light cones are excluded in space time if you have two light cones right next to each other which are non intersecting that's the only way you can say that this event in the future wasn't caused by this event in the past and uh, there's a fundamental limit in electromagnetism and that is that all changes can only propagate at, at the top speed they can propagate is at the speed of light uh, so if if there's a vector that lies outside it that just means it isn't going to cause any changes it's it's not going to cause anything that lies inside the light cone uh, chinmaya i hope i'm getting that right you can uh, can pitch in whatever you can your mic is unmuted so you're more than welcome to um uh, okay yes and what you can do with uh, like like vectors which is to say that they lie right on the border uh is well again you can distinguish between uh future and past and that's exactly how sort of causality propagates uh and for you know time like vectors again uh, i'm sorry for space like vectors they yeah they're not technically they're not the four velocity of anything because they lie outside the light cone and that's kind of not <laughs> that's kind of illegal uh, because that's that's the uh, speed which causation can occur right so you cannot exactly distinguish uh, between uh, space like Uh, uh vectors and that's essentially because they do not obey the laws of causality that uh, electromagnetism sort of imposes on us or what special relativity imposes on us right and uh like i said earlier just the length of a vector it's basically like counting you know, the number of grid lines uh on a graph sheet if you just draw a line you want to find out what's the length uh you can use pythagoras's theorem and then you can just count the number of uh you know boxes it crosses and then find it out but again the pythagorean theorem doesn't have to hold everywhere it only holds in euclidean space it just may not hold uh you know in all spaces right um so well this is uh, yet another uh, representation well um I'm not really going to go into detail here but you're more than free to look at it it's basically just a superposition of all these three onto a uh, two dimensional graph uh, one plus one dimensions essentially right so we've been dealing with a lot of spaces uh so as as usual we'll just use uh, a bit of etymology orthogonal means perpendicular uh if you're given a vector then the metric can actually be used to specify all the directions that are perpendicular to it so you can sort of uh collect these uh vectors you can you can sort of collect them at a point and you can you can sort of form a plane around them and this plane is called the orthogonal subspace so if you have a vector you can this is your metric and using this you can find out what's orthogonal to the vector and you can thus create a plane out of it right um yeah and this is pretty much the same thing but in space time so your hyperboloid is used to specify the metric and if this is a vector your metric can tell you what's perpendicular and out of that you can form a plane 
Well, again, for the two-dimensional case, find angles. You just you can just oops. Yep. You can just look at this and we know what the dot product formula is, and it's essentially a very naive calculation. But this is a more interesting angle to uh, what it means in uh, Minkowski space. And what it means is usually the cosine lies between minus one and one, but in Minkowski space, it can sort of go above one. And uh, this is what we call the gamma factor, which is basically a very fancy way of denoting the Lorentz transform, which is basically the one by square root of one minus b squared for the one dimensional case. Right, and we've all seen this, and uh, it's it's quite closely related to the angles because uh, if you I can't remember exactly, but there was this set of notes that Chimney sent over, and uh, there was a way of representing uh, a Lorentz matrix uh, as a form of a hyperbolic rotation matrix itself. So yeah, so you can use the Lorentz matrix or just the metric itself sort of compute uh, gamma factors and uh, angles. Well, you can also use uh, a metric to define magnitudes of forms. That is, when I say forms, I mean uh, functions, uh, in a sense. So if you were to measure the magnitude of a one form, which you can sort of think of as grid lines passing over, uh, so what you what you could then think of is what how do I specify the magnitude of these grid lines or how do I specify the magnitude of this covector or one form? Well, all you'd need to do is just count the number of grid lines that this is cutting through, this object is cutting through, and you just need to uh, divide that by two. So if, if this is an n-dimensional manifold that I have on my one form, all I need to do is uh, do a simple calculation of n minus one, oops, n minus one by two. And that will essentially give my uh, magnitude. And again, it, it sort of varies the higher up as you go. If you want to measure the magnitude of a two form, then that would, that would mean you just place an n-dimensional manifold on the two form and you do n minus two by pi, you'll get the magnitude. So again, you have more and more formulas but uh, let's not go into that. Let's not get lost there, right? So the metric again, uh, like I mentioned earlier, can be used to convert a vector to a covector or one form, and a one form to a vector. And this is just again a fancy way of saying I can raise or lower my indices by multiplying it by the matrix. So I hope you guys remember this x mu. The twistedness, uh, as we saw earlier, is uh, invariant under this, uh, you know, index lowering and uh, raising. For space-like vectors, the orientation again is also preserved, and for time-like vectors, it's also it's the same case. And uh, a very interesting instance for light-like vectors. Uh, well, you just the the covector for light-like -like, light -like vectors is always perpendicular to the vector itself, and uh, don't know why this is true, but it's an interesting uh, property. Yep, and this is a very visual way of uh, looking at things. So if I have a space-like vector, the orientation doesn't change. Uh, well, for a time-like vector, it's reversed. And for a light-like vector, it's always going to be just perpendicular. OK, so I mentioned this really weird uh, name that's called a Hodge dual. Uh, let me just try to review it for you guys. Well, it gives you, it, it, it's basically a function. It's much similar to your covector. Oops. It, it takes in a P form, a P form, which is, uh, you know, a, a, a function that takes 
P number of vectors. Okay, I'm just going to keep going. I'm going to keep uh, going. If I, I'll end up with a vector, like my pth vector, and it takes me to my real line. So this is what you guys should think of when I say p form. Well, it it takes a p form, and it gives a unique n minus one n minus p form, where n is the uh, dimension of the manifold on which you have the p form. Uh, and another thing is, it gives you this n minus p form such that it is orthogonal or perpendicular to it. Well, obviously, the twistedness is changed. And if one starts, uh, and another important property of Riemannian geometry, I think, which we'll explore later on when we're doing GR and so on, is if you start with an untwisted uh, p form, you take the Hodge dual of it, you'll end up with a n minus p form with pretty much the same orientation. And there are a few properties, but you wouldn't really require them much to go forward. The measure from a metric, uh, again, it's a rather, it's a, it's a concept that's given very little space, so I wouldn't rather uh, delve into it. Right. So what is a smooth map? It's just a function that maps one, one manifold to another. And, excuse me, the simplest case, uh, Chimaya had also uh, mentioned it earlier, uh, is what is called a diffeomorphism. And uh, whenever you see a fancy term, uh, the first step is to break it down. So you see, uh, you see two words here, you see diffeo and you see morphism. So, well, I really don't know what diffeo means, but whenever I see morphism, I know it's a map or it's a function where one particular structure or many particular structures are preserved. All right, so you see morphism. I want you guys to think something's being preserved. We got to find out what it is, right? So uh, in the case of a diffeomorphism, it's it's what you call a one-to-one -one, uh, function or one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, your points in the manifold uh, and the target manifold. So a one-to-one -one map is essentially wrong pen. <laughs> Is, is to say that if I have these points on my manifold and this is on my target manifold, no, uh, if I have these points such that I'm basically doing a one-to-one -one map. So yeah, so due to this one-to-one -one map uh, property, you have a lot of corollaries and uh, what happens is that they must have the same dimension, and in a few senses, they must look the same, right? So, but however, when you include, uh, if you if this manifold has a particular metric and this one has a different metric, uh, obviously they will be uh, looking different. So a smooth map is in a sense that you can, uh, it, it, it's a map that you can use to talk between two different metrics as well. For example, uh, if you map in let's take optics as an example if you map between one manifold where there's light rays that travel in straight lines and in another you you can sort of think of it uh, as light traveling uh, with a hidden object so it's it's sort of uh, like looking at uh, a torch that is being shined under water uh, you can look at it from the outside it's going to be diffracted but if you look at it from the inside it's going to look different to be dispersed so yeah, well, we've actually encountered smooth maps before and it's precisely in the embedding of submanifolds. And in this case, we're basically mapping each point in a, in a lower manifold. So you have, a, you have a lower manifold and you have a embedding manifold. So I'm, I'm just gonna map from here to here, right? So what this means is uh, every point in this, uh, well, in, in that case, Every point in the embedding manifold, uh, sorry, embedded manifold, this is usually, it usually corresponds to a unique point here because it's a one-to-one -one map. But what happens is you can still have some regions that are not being mapped at all in the embedding manifold. So, yeah. Uh, and another way, and another uh, uh, map is what is called a projection map, which is basically the opposite of this and a uh, 
this is a good example of a projection map. What I'm doing is I'm taking a three-dimensional manifold. These are two lines in my 3D manifold, and I'm sort of projecting them uh, onto a sheet of paper or uh, a 2D manifold. So a way of looking at this is uh, if you've ever gone to those puppetry shows, where they sort of just shine light and they move puppets, but then you only get to see the projection on uh, the screen, which is visible to the audience. You don't get to see the, the puppets uh, that are moving. So, yeah. Well, after this discussion, it's quite natural to move into what is called uh, pullbacks. Uh, well, a pullback is basically, again, a pullback is also a map. But it's a very particular type of map. A pullback basically means if I have two manifolds, manifold A, manifold B, I'm basically going to map all of my co-vectors here to this map. That's as exactly what a pullback is. Right? Obviously, we'll limit ourselves to diffeomorphisms here. But this is essentially the crux of what a pullback in the, in the context of differential geometry is. When you hear pullback, I want you to think a map between co-vectors. Right? So what essentially happens here is pullbacks, they preserve the degree of form, they preserve the twistedness of a form. But however, like obviously, when you're transforming between two manifolds, there is a little deformation going on. Right. So in, in Chinmaya's lecture, he talked a little bit about what topology is. And for a topologist, a torus and a uh, okay, this is a very bad representation of a coffee bug. Trust me, I do have good coffee bugs, but yeah, are pretty much the same object because they just have one hole. So how does this morphing happen? What morphs? Well, that's a rather tough question. And unless the metric is defined, because you if you can't define angles, you can't define lengths, it's kind of senseless to talk about the difference between a torus and a coffee bug. Because essentially they look the same because they have the same number of uh, holes. Right. So well, for if you you can take pullbacks uh, of P forms, as this title suggests. And if you take the uh, pullback with respect to an embedding manifold, that is, if you take, see, uh, if you take the this map of an embedding manifold here, if I'm trying to take the co-vectors from, what exactly happens is you end up with an intersection of the particular sub-manifold with uh, the form manifolds uh, that Rishi was speaking about. And uh, again, if you're uh, if you have pulled back a P form in an m-dimensional manifold, you'll to an n-dimensional manifold, you'll you basically end up uh, with uh, a P form submanifolds which have m minus p dimensions uh, because the intersection of these m minus p dimension uh, form submanifolds with these other n minus uh, e manifolds, well, they'll correspond exactly to what a p form is. And your p form is basically just, as uh, Rishi mentioned earlier, you're taking a vector, you're taking a covector, and, or oh, I'm sorry, you're taking multiple vectors, and you just want to get to a real number. So these images uh, will give us a good picture of what it means. So a projection mapping is just as we saw earlier. And uh, if you take the pullback with respect to a 2D manifold, which is a red plane, uh, embedding onto a 3D manifold, well, you have an untwisted two form, uh, which is the blue curves here. You will actually end up with a uh, twisted uh, two form. I'm sorry, you'll end up with an untwisted two form, sorry, uh, which is a green dot. If you project this line on this 3D object here, you'll end up with a dot. Yeah. Uh, and there are a few more examples given here. If you pull back with respect to a 2D thing, again, it's all about intersections and it's all about uh, what's perpendicular to what. Yep. So, uh, 
you can definitely apply uh, pullbacks to uh, metrics. So what does it mean to pull back a metric? Uh, well, well, when you, when you pull back a metric, when you basically say, I'm going to go from, uh, because of a metric in a sense, in a very loose sense is a type of P form. You, I'm basically saying, I want to go from one manifold to another for this particular metric. You'll obviously uh, end up with a uh, different metric, which is uh, with respect to the second uh, manifold. And this is this is a uh, this is called a induced uh, metric. And uh, for example, if you have a tori which is embedded into flat three D space, you get uh, something that is shown in figure uh, sixty one. So yeah. So if you try to pull back this onto flat, you basically end up with circles, basically projecting these peers onto this uh, flat manifold. And uh, we use a different term when it comes to transforming vectors. And that word is called push forward. And it's, again, a very fancy way of describing a function. Uh, well, it's just the word is just fancy, but the, uh, the function is very simple. So if I have a manifold here, and if I have a vector, a bunch of vectors here, what, what it means is, if I want to, if I if I'm doing this push forward operation, it basically means I'm having a vector in manifold A, I'm having a vector in manifold B, and I'm going to take the tangent of this vector, and I'm going to map it to this tangent here. So it's basically a map between uh, tangent spaces. So you can sort of think it, think of it as T A going to T B, right? Uh, well, of course, it's a little weird because uh, obviously sometimes one particular tangent can correspond to multiple tangents here. It, it isn't exactly a one-to-one uh, -one map. So you could say that sometimes push forwards aren't diffeomorphisms because a diffeomorphism in a strict sense has to be a one-to-one -one map, right? Uh, and sometimes it may not even uh, obviously it does it does not result in a vector field, and that's precisely because some have no vectors associated with them. Some can just be tangents with no vectors, or some can just have multiple, you know, points associated. So there's a little bit of vagueness surrounding this. And armed with this uh, uh, understanding, I'm just trying to be dramatic. You can quickly uh, sort of go slide into electromagnetism. But before that, let's just look at push forward of a vector. And this is exactly what I mean. So if I want to map the tangent vectors, I'm basically mapping this tangent to this tangent, or this tangent to this tangent. So, so yeah, so this is exactly what is called a push forward operation. And armed with this, uh, we'll step into electromagnetism. And we will use this, we will use electromagnetism as a very exploratory way of sort of visualizing everything that we discussed so far. We're just trying to put it all together and uh, look at things. Right. So the basic elements of uh, you know electromagnetism are Maxwell's equations, and they are described uh, using four vector fields. You have E, B, D, and H, and uh, there's this uh, relation between D and E, and then B and H. So uh, these are what you call uh, permeability and permittivity. Uh, they, in a sense, describe the medium. And uh, they are constants, essentially. And the reason they are constants is uh, because, well, you want your, uh, the way light behaves is it, the, the propagation of frequencies, uh, well, you know, the radiation of different frequencies, they do travel at the same speed. So that's exactly why this is a constant and not a variable. Right? So whenever you think D and E, uh, see D and E, you can, uh, sort of keep this uh, notation in mind. And a very naive example would be uh, if we didn't have this property of these permeability and permittivity being constants, uh, you wouldn't have rainbows. <laughs> so yeah, uh, you wouldn't have all uh, light rays sort of dispersing equally. Each frequency would disperse in different fashions. So, yeah. Uh, but again, uh, there is a degree of compli 
complexity uh, when it comes to Maxwell's equations. Uh, one, uh, the, the reason is because they are linear equations. Uh, so they, in a sense, most, e even if you take up any electromagnetic te electromagnetism textbook, you're looking at toy models most of the time. Uh, so uh, sometimes electromagnetic phenomena can be quote unquote nonlinear, or sometimes they can break down or behave differently uh, you know, at uh, Planck length. So again, uh, you can take Maxwell's equations uh, in a sense to be an effective uh, field theory of uh, electromagnetic phenomena, right? And again, uh, you you've got a few more things uh, in Maxwell's equations. You have well, you have rho and you have j. So your rho and j give rise to your uh, charge and your magnetic field, essentially, right? And obviously, when we were looking at uh, four vectors, if you guys remember, when Chinmay was speaking, the what's the first component of a momentum four vector? I'm, I'm just asking. Uh, guys, is anyone here? It's the energy. You are hearing exactly. Yeah, I can hear you. Exactly. So similarly, uh, you have a, a four vector J nu, all right? And the first component of this J nu is actually just rho. All right? So I'm just trying to build a level of uh, similarity. And uh, again, you sort of can do the same four vector logic and you can uh, rename, uh, you know, you can combine this and uh, the notation we use here is this weird H to denote this JNU. This JNU is basically a combination of rho and J. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, you, this weird J, yes. But usually, uh, most places you see it as JNU. So whenever you see new or mu, instead of mu, you should think, okay, four components. That's it. And uh, let me just uh, write down uh, Maxwell's equations for a bit here. Uh, and obviously, we'll start with electrostatics and magnetostatics. And uh, Gauss's law basically states that the divergence of the uh, electric field is basically, uh, sorry, yeah, the divergence of D, sorry, is given by uh, rho. Or this, in an alternate notation, uh, as, as we saw earlier, is basically divergence of E is equal to rho by epsilon naught. Right. So what this, uh, and there are a few more laws. So you have the curl of E is zero, which means it's curl free. What does it uh, mean for something to be curl free? Well, uh, it's, there's a special word for this. It's called uh, solenoidal. And um, well, actually I think this should be B. It shouldn't be E. Uh, there's a mistake in the paper. So it, B is actually curl free. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. E, curl free basically means if I have a magnet, not the south, the field lines are gonna look like this. My curl always, uh, I mean, yeah, my divergence always measures my net outward flux. That's uh, as divergence as an operator in vector calculus means, what's my net outward flux? So your divergence can be negative or positive. Negative means there's inward flux, positive means there's outward flux, right? So if you just take the, yeah, so when when I say, and curl basically measures, uh, you know, with respect to a perpendicular vector. Uh, one second, much, but uh, shouldn't it be like the gradient, like the gradient of the magnetic field should be zero? Like. Oh, oops, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Divergence sorry. of, yeah, 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 yeah. I am sorry, I am sorry. The divergence, wow, it's just been one semester. Uh, yeah, the divergence of B is zero, which basically means there's no net outward flux of this magnetic field. Whatever happens, all the lines that come from the north just end up in the south. And uh, for uh, E, it's curlless. So yeah. Uh, and in the language of forms, we can sort of rewrite these uh, vector calculus equations. So that's what we're going to do with all of these knowledge of forms duals and metrics, we're just going to sort of uh, change the language in which we're speaking. So 
uh, obviously the visual way of looking at this for Gauss's law, first things first, uh, nabla dot E is equal to rho by epsilon naught. The positive charge is given by a twisted three form, which is the dot here. And this twisted three forms magnitude is given by rho, which is the uh, charge density. Charge density basically means net charge by volume, right? And this is also, okay, so I can look at this to cause these field lines. Or I can I can consider the field lines themselves to be uh, fundamental, which is what we're doing with considering uh, this uh, you know three form rho uh, as the twisted two form of these black lines. Uh, twisted two form, as in uh, in a more visual sense. Again, whenever is whenever I say two forms or one forms, think grid lines. Really, really weird grid lines that can be spaced out or uh, spaced out. And uh, in uh, in a vacuum or similar constructions, uh, you have a correspondence between the D and E. Uh, so this is to say that, uh, well, the D is basically the Hodge dual. This field lines are basically the Hodge dual of the rho that is causing these field lines. So you have two different pictures for just one electrostatic, uh, you know, situation that's going on here. And you can do something similar with magnetic fields uh, if your uh, magnetic two form B, this is B, this line is my two form B, are unbroken curves, which basically means they extend, uh, you know, they're basically non compact to say that this is the manifold in which B lies in, B is going from one end to the other end of a manifold. It, there's no boundary to it. And if this is unbroken uh, to the non divergence, which, which basically means uh, it has orientation. And yet again, it has external orientation, orientation, which is given by green, which is lines that you'll always see associated with uh, your, uh, you know, magnetic field B. And your red, okay, yeah. So your, mm, okay, we'll we'll dive into this. So, uh, yeah, we just reviewed this. Yep. So again, there's a get another uh, correspondence here. Uh, two different pictures. You can look at the orientation, or you can look at the field lines themselves. Well, uh, this is uh, this is due to the fact that uh, you know, for example, if you throw an electron in the magnetic field, it's only going to change its direction, right? That comes from the uh, Lorentz force law. Well, again, two different pictures, and they are both sort of Hodge duals of each other. This can, again, you can again uh, apply this uh, to Ampere's law, which I think it makes it more obvious. So this is my line of constant current. And if I have a constant current, uh, the twisted, uh, this is a twisted J form, uh, I mean, sorry, twisted two form, uh, J. And you can sort of think of this line uh, to be the derivative of this H form. That is to say that, okay, if I have this H form that intersects with this line, I can then take the derivative and I can arrive at uh, these, this twisted uh, two form. And again, uh, this, is, this is a Hodge dual uh, correspondence between these two. So similar case for the permanent magnet, uh, your blue curves, and uh, are basically twisted one forms and uh, your ellipsoids these really really weird ellipsoids are generated by the permanent magnet and you can see that they are actually perpendicular uh, uh, you know the field lines are actually perpendicular to the b fields thus uh, obviously you can then say that they coincide that these field lines intersect with this and uh, this is again due to a really weird phenomena that happens in permanent life, where, uh, you know, the, the closer you approach the poles, weirder your uh, field gets, your field lines get. And uh, yeah, so these are electrostatic examples, but what happens for electrodynamics where, where my charges can move? Well, then we're just going to head to space time. And uh, you're going to see some really weird thing that's going on here. We're actually trying to uh, represent the entire space-time here. So 
that would mean you have three dimensions of space in one dimension of time so uh, to, for starters uh, we can start with the conservation of electric charge so what does it mean for electric charge to be conserved in space time so that means you have a twisted three form j uh, that can be interpreted as uh, particles as charge particles and they're basically spread out all over space time and uh, in a sense if you choose the metric correctly these lines are just going to be straight lines and as we've seen in even a naive space time diagram you have a straight line going i'm sorry you have a uh, straight line going through space time that basically means the object is stationary so uh, in a sense that in a sense you could say that okay your charges do not change over time but obviously uh, your individual charges can change over time uh, whereas the net charge uh, remains the same so uh, your 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 uh, conservation of uh, charge uh, is basically a very complex way of saying if i take the time derivative of the sum of all charges i'll get zero basically means no change in time but of course uh, this is a consequence of maxwell's laws and it's a consequence of very ideal cases uh, this doesn't happen all the time i mean yeah just look at your batteries uh, next what we could go to is uh, conservation of magnetic flux so uh, well what happens here is if you so initially we thought of charges as uh, lines in space time but uh, if your charges were allowed to dynamically move then you know what happens when a charge moves you you end up with a uh, magnetic field b around it which is denoted by this maroon uh, you know arrow here and essentially that creates a field that is perpendicular to this right and the influence of this field is what is denoted by this uh, blue slice let's say it, it it encodes both of those fields and then since we're in four dimensions they form uh, they they, they uh, loop outside and they create these two dimensional uh, sub manifolds right so this is basically trying to uh, yeah so this was something that we also looked at so you can look at the mu nu uh, this is my f mu nu right this square is containing my f mu nu and uh, you can then say that with respect to time uh, i'm sorry with respect to x x mu this basically just if i just differentiate this if i take one particular slice of this and if i want to look at the change of it i'm basically going to just end up with how my charge changes so i'll end up with this so this is uh, a very fancy notation to denote uh, two of the maxwell equations that encode uh, e and b well you wouldn't just need to consider uh, normal fields you can also consider excited fields right so your excited fields basically encode uh, the permittivity of the medium as well so why do we call it excited is basically it tells you exactly how excited or most of the time how non excited uh, light rays or electromagnetic radiation is as it passes through a particular object with uh, a set of properties so yeah and uh, this is basically uh, us showing uh, the maxwell's equations that contain d and h and d and h are basically you know e and b along with your permittivity and permeability well uh, we've talked about uh, these two things separately and uh, you can combine them through the uh, lorentz force law well the easiest way of saying things is to say that okay these things are actually perpendicular sub manifolds in four dimensions they have the same orientation right and this is just a visual representation of f is equal to q e uh, cross b cross uh, plus uh, b cross b right so that's basically the lorentz force law and uh, again it, it's quite easy to see the math like uh, you cause you have the cross product for v and b so which means uh, your magnitude increases as the more perpendicular uh, these two sub manifolds are and they are in general uh, perpendicular and depending on the media or the velocity of propagation Uh, what you can do then is just take a singular particle, which is uh, you know represented by 
this line uh, this world line green green world line and uh, well your lorenz force is basically just going to be your straight arrow red and it's orthogonal to the form f near you the the tensor that we talked about right here so and moving forward this uh, will definitely be very useful with gr and on that note i'd like to conclude the talk and uh, if you could just excuse me for 2 minutes uh, i'll be back and uh, i'll be ready to field questions i just get some water thank you guys okay so anybody has any questions yeah okay, shoot If you have any questions regarding my or Rishi's side of stuff, you could ask us. Yeah, personally, my opinions on this paper was it's till the halfway mark. It's kind of like visually okay, but then like towards like the end, like there is a limit, right, to which you can just visualize stuff. You it's need equations to present yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if- yeah. All of physics could be visual. It would be a little, you know, much more easier. Anyone could major in physics. That's yeah. That is the the thing is this is where it all falls apart. Where it says you know when you like visualize something, it's easier. No, it's not. Like for example, the metric is so much easier when you just write it as you know g mu nu instead of you know like drawing all those hyperboloids and stuff. You know, hmm. I guess like this is just a really real. a basic paper right it doesn't yeah. even like it is even mentioned in the painting like, that ashnit high school students can take a look at this yes yes so you, and I it, mean, it kind of i think we can critique this paper with because like it yeah, doesn't like, really a little equations the, at some points would have been better where yeah like, like some new concepts like how you express like the p mm-hmm. space stuff mm mm-hmm. mm Like at least like a brief idea would have been mm. kind of cool, but then they didn't. They he just like he just wanted to just make it completely visual, and mm. it kind of falls apart after the metric. You know, the metric is eh, mm. okay, fine, but then the Hodge dual, the full full back, the push back, and all of that is mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of tedious to you know visualize it as a. Mm. Maybe I did a good job. Just paper on the based on the assumption that everybody know knew these mathematically yes. and now was trying to do it. Like, yes, totally. yes. It's like one, if it would be But fine then, if like you were acquainted with these topics and then you looked no. at it, it would make sense. Yeah. But then the thing is, time, but then the thing is, I thought about it that way. But then you should be critical of that guy because in the beginning, what he mentions is that even a high schooler or anybody who's completed school can. 